I thought I needed to show that anthropology did have some relationship to the real world, more than you think. <laughs> or that, um, thank you, Nasser. Um, I'm, I'm now about to introduce our invited guest speaker, Mary Rose Bruzewitz. And I'm sure you never expected that you'd have to follow Lady Gaga in your <laughs> Indeed, today, I am honored to welcome one of our own as this year's commencement speaker. Mary Rose Bruzewich earned both her bachelor's in anthropology and her law degree right here at UCLA. Since then, she's built an impre impressive career at the noted international law firm Strasburger & Price, where she's co-head of their international practice and partner in charge of their New York office. Fluent in both Spanish and Portuguese, Mary Rose concentrates her practice in Latin America, and she's worked in virtually every country south of our border, as well as throughout Europe and Asia. To proudly quote from her official bio, Ms. Bruswich uses her anthropology and legal training to serve as guide and interpreter for clients and counterparties assisting them to gain deeper understanding of how business realities differ from country to country and how behavioral and linguistic nuances may impact relationships. Right on, Mary Rose. <laughs> She's also done considerable pro bono work in the microfinance and impact investing sectors, especially on climate change and carbon trading. When not jetting around the world, Mary Rose serves on the panel of the Inter-American Development Bank's Independent Consultation and Investigation Mechanism. You can ask her if you want to know what that is. She's also on the board of the Microfinance Club of New York. She's a sought-after guest speaker and a professor at the University of Michigan Law School. And I'm delighted to add that we'll have Mary Rose back again for two weeks um, next uh, winter. Um, she's been chosen as a Regents Lecturer, um, and her um, coming to the department and the law school will be our first joint endeavor with the law school. So we are indeed proud to have, as one of our own, such a highly accomplished, socially responsible, and informed global citizen who, through her, through her inspiring work, is making a positive impact on the world. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome our commencement speaker of the class of 2012, Mary Rose Bruce Well, good morning, everyone. It's very wonderful to be back at UCLA on this fine day and to be among so many colleagues who do know what anthropology is. I'm honored to be here, and I really uh, thank uh, the Dean of the College of Letters and Science, Chair Browner, members of the anthropology faculty, and all those who helped me organize my participation uh, in this uh, ceremony today. It's a very important milestone for everyone present. I'm sure a lot of you are anxious to get going. Uh, probably you're exhausted from partying um, and winding things down here, and you're ready to take your hot robes off and finish your well-deserved celebrating, so I will try to be brief. All worthwhile opportunities inspire both pride and fear. Giving this speech is a perfect chance to either make a complete fool of myself or to do right by you. I accepted this opportunity as usual with most challenges in my life without really having thought it through, but here I am, so I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna try to share with you a little bit of my path in life. Um, because I started out in a very small town in Southern California and sort of happened to come to UCLA and um, major in anthropology and then get a law degree. And then I ended up going to New York and becoming a practicing lawyer. Um, and now I've kind of come full circle and I'm doing a lot of uh, pro bono work and microfinancing work. So I'm trying to really demonstrate today a little bit about how my professional life has evolved and to give you a little bit of advice about how to use anthropology in your future. Of course, like an anthropologist, I decided to do some research on commencement speeches, and so I basically went to commencementspeech.com uh, so that I could find some words of wisdom for myself for this occasion. I wanted to see what the market is for these types of speeches. In the best speeches, the speakers tell you, do what you love, 
this is wonderful advice. Some people actually know instinctively what path to follow, and they early on know how to listen to their own feelings. Others struggle to discover what their real calling is. I, for example, am still not sure what my true calling is. At the outset of my professional life, I never would have thought I would have been a practicing lawyer, but here I am 30 years later. I feel my calling is still evolving, and I hope to demonstrate to you why I feel that's true and why this is relevant for all of us in this day and age, because most of us will have several careers. That's just the way it is. And I want to basically tell you, don't worry if you don't have a complete life plan or blueprint already with the, few, the first few boxes all checked off. That's not really how life happens for most of us. Other speakers highlight the very productive role of mistakes and failure in life. A choice may take us down a path that seems wrong or uncomfortable, and once we get over our disappointment and anger, even so, we can find that we've learned a great deal. Maybe we've learned something that we do not want to do at the very minimum, which is valuable information. What makes the difference is not whether we make mistakes or whether we fail or whether we make bad choices, because we will. That's just a fact of life. The important element is what do we do with that? Do we use the information that we glean to guide ourselves, or do we beat ourselves up and give up? Do we pay attention and learn from the challenges and convert them into productive sources of information and guidance or not? Judgment and discernment grow from experiences, both painful and positive. Another thread that wove through many of the speeches I read or watched on video was the role of serendipity. This sang out to me. Can we work with whatever life serves up to us and make it our own? Many choices that I have made have been serendipitous and perhaps not thought through at the outset, but later on, somehow things have developed into or woven into a pattern that makes sense. There's actually a saying in Brazil that basically says, in the, earn, in the end, it turns out okay. If it is not okay, it's because we're not at the end yet. I always keep moving. I try to learn new skills and gain new knowledge in areas that I've not done before. I face new challenges and I endure the discomfort of not knowing what I'm doing, like today, for example, or where I will arrive next. I seek out new places and experience, but more importantly, I nurture and develop relationships. When I meet new people, I try to connect them with others. In essence, I believe that Circumstances may change due to events beyond my control, but the more knowledge and experience I can gain, the greater will be my ability to survive and flourish. As people have mentioned today in this market, I'm sure you feel the pressure from many directions. You may ask yourself or be asked by your loved ones or friends, why did you choose anthropology? What job can you find in this difficult jobs market? Are, are you going to end up back at home with your parents? There are many pressures to choose to specialize and to know right now what you want to do with your whole life. I know exactly how you feel. I hope my story will show you that the path will not be clear at the outset and from time to time you will feel lost. You will need to be patient with yourself and the universe, develop good habits and persevere. And in that way you will move forward bit by bit or sometimes by leaps. You'll be sensitive to external forces, but most of all, honor your own feelings. You'll take charge of your life and your career because no one else really will. You can notice what you like, what makes you happy and engaged, and live your life proactively. Right now, the world is mired in many conflicts and crises that are fundamentally based on anthropological subject matter, religious, socioeconomic, cultural, historical and philosophical divergences. The ability to understand and translate and navigate among multiple cultures is extremely valuable in a world where access to technology, the means of communication, and the stuff is increasing constantly. You chose well. You selected a field that well prepares you for life in the world today, regardless of your subsequent career path. Even if you do not work in an area that's directly international in scope, increasing globalization is inevitable. There are cultures within cultures. Each profession, each class or group, whether geographical or otherwise, has a distinct history with its impact on behavior and mores. So I want to share some pieces of my history to illustrate this. 
As I said, I grew up in a very small town in Southern California. I was a musician. I played the oboe and the clarinet and the flute. I was a musical child. I never knew what anthropology really was. Um, basically, my family thought I would be a musician, and perhaps a flaky musician. But I was really too much of a generalist, and I loved too many fields, and so I wasn't sure that that was right for me. The reality is that in my small town, I didn't really know about what college to go to. There was no internet at that time, and I didn't have a real set goal of where I wanted to go. Basically, my life plan was escape. I wanted to get out of the small town, which I will not name because I don't want to insult anyone. Uh, my plan was to leave, that's it. That was my life plan, that was my blueprint. By chance, one of my high school friends applied to UCLA, so I applied to UCLA. Um, I started taking breadth requirements, uh, physics and all sorts of things that I really was afraid of, um, and I started taking anthropology. I wasn't sure what I loved. My friend took Spanish, so I took Spanish. And basically, for a couple of years, I would still toy with the idea of majoring in music, but basically, uh, eventually, anthropology took root and attracted me more and more. So, but I still didn't know what I would really do with it. I started taking graduate seminars, and I think what I really found attractive was the people in anthropology, the other students and the professors. I liked them, I thought that it was fun to be around them, and I liked studying things with them. I took a class by chance on legal anthropology offered by Sally Falk Moore, who was here uh, temporarily teaching. I admired her. She had trained as a lawyer and worked on Wall Street, and eventually was involved in the Nuremberg trials and became an anthropologist. I found this fascinating. I took and enjoyed archaeology field courses, but it wasn't really for me, I didn't think. Um, I did a study while I was in, in uh, college of the people who fish from the pier in Santa Monica. I did a study comparing the, the treatment of, or the, the interaction of, of people in the small claims court in a wealthy area versus sort of a poor area here. Uh, at, uh, in Los Angeles. And then I decided to try my hand at field work, and I applied to participate in a summer course in Peru offered by UC Irvine. So there, in 1978, I flew uh, probably my third plane flight in my life to Peru. I was very young and inexperienced. I had my college Spanish, um, and I really hadn't thought through the details, as it turns out. I landed in Lima, Peru um, on sort of an election day to put into place a new constitution. Um, and basically there were machine gun guards on every corner, so I was pretty afraid. I checked into the hotel and afterwards I realized this is not the hotel people told me to check into and I wondered about my safety. In any event, I made my way by bus, obviously I didn't think it through, from uh, Lima all the way to Cusco um, and basically um, arrived um, to, to take part in this program. I decided, based on my experience with Sally Falk Moore, to tackle a very complex subject, which was really how the Quechua-speaking Indians were treated in the Spanish-speaking court system. And somehow I gained entree to a court, and I did some work there. Um, I won't really go into my, my findings, because I was a pretty naive uh, person, and I probably could have taken the course that was described today about how to design a research project. But despite all of the sort of stresses of, of, uh, of doing this study, I really discovered a lot about myself. I liked to travel and experience foreign cultures, but I really didn't know very much about legal systems. And so it was difficult for me, it was difficult for me to actually do my work. So I decided to go to law school. And I really thought I would go back to anthropology, uh, but I ended up uh, studying here at, at UCLA. And actually, as people have talked about today, I used my anthropology training at law school. I really didn't like it all that much. In fact, I found it unpleasant. People were very competitive. It was very different from anthropology. So when I was stressed out, I would pretend that I was studying this dreadful tribe of law school people. Um, <laughs> And I found this very, very helpful throughout my life. You can always sort of switch into a different mode if you really uh, need to. Um, basically, I stuck it out. I graduated from law school, and I um, sort of got caught up in the hunt for legal jobs. Having watched a lot of That Girl, which probably some of you don't even know about, I decided to go to New York. 
another serendipitous decision that really wasn't well thought through. And I, by surprise, got a job at a big Wall Street law firm. So I moved back east. Coming from California at the time, people thought that I was a valley girl, that I must live on bean sprouts, and you know, pretty much I got hazed a lot for being from the West Coast in New York. Um, I didn't have any relatives or anyone to really uh, give me a cultural introduction to Wall Street and, and uh, the New York uh, big uh, law atmosphere. So again, I used my anthropology training to study these bizarre people at the law firm. And by chance, because my roommate had taken Spanish, I spoke Spanish, I had done my field work in Peru, and um, basically when I arrived in New York in 1982, it was the lost decade of restructurings in Latin America. So I sort of got drafted. Um, my, my Spanish was actually pretty rusty, so it was a, another sort of case of acting that I had to sort of uh, spiff up my Spanish and get business Spanish, but I started working on uh, Latin American restructurings. I ended up living in Venezuela. I was loaned to a client for a year. I lived there by myself, um, sort of working uh, within the culture of a bank, again, using my anthropological skills. And when the capital market started to open up in the 90s, um, I started learning Portuguese. And basically, for 30 years, I've been working on international transaction work, uh, mostly in Latin America because of my language skills, but I've worked in many places. In the last 10 years, as I said earlier, I've sort of come full circle, and because of microfinancing, I really feel that I'm uh, getting back on my early path that I developed after being in Peru to work on development and poverty reduction. And I'm able to use my legal and anthropologi uh, anthropological skills to really help the lives of the working poor. As Carol alluded to, I describe the best part of what I do as a lawyer specializing in cross-border transactions as being a cultural and transactional guide. When people work with people from different countries, start businesses in different countries, and in general deal with people from different countries and cultures, there's a need to take into account legal systems, social systems, historical and cultural differences. It's tempting for people to think that the rule of law somehow exists in some abstract way and trumps things, but really it's the linguistic, linguistic cultural, and societal norms that govern um, how people run their lives. In thinking about takeaways for all of you, I guess I would say that having great goals and plans is wonderful. It's even essential. But plans are ideas. They're projections. As we know from the financial crisis, projections and models really aren't reality. You have to take into account humanity. And I think that though we should have a vision about where we're going to head, we'll never have all the facts at hand and we can't control what happens in life. We change, the economy changes, our relationships change, things are not fair, for better or for worse, but we can still go forward. Your chosen major really keeps you prepared to open up to change and to be prepared to meet the unexpected. You can develop further your ability to discern what you like and so that you can make wise choices and adapt to reality. You can maintain, most of all, compassion for yourself and others because you'll make mistakes. Other people will make mistakes. You'll hurt them, they'll hurt you. As with all achievements, graduating is a moment to celebrate. That's another thing I think it's important to do. Celebrate today, congratulate yourselves, your professors, colleagues, and your parents, your loved ones, and your support network. Honor yourself and the work that you've done to arrive at this moment. And always remember to do that with all of your milestones, great and small. However, after the hangover wears off and you've turned in your hot robe, you'll see that once again, you're at the bottom of another hill just as you did after you graduated from high school and came to college, or if you are a, a graduate student when you, convinced, when you completed your undergraduate career. This is gonna happen many times during your life. There's no arrival point. There's never a moment where everything is done to perfection. The only constant that will greet you relentlessly is change. Our lives are journeys over which we have little control with a huge, huge and wonderful exception. You can control your own actions and reactions. Right now, we don't know what opportunities and challenges you will face, but you can work hard, be humble, keep moving forward, and maintain your resilience and sense of humor and take advantage of serendipity. 
Congratulations, class of 2012, and to the professors, classmates, parents, and loved ones who helped this class.